What's up, everybody? I'm the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and if you've been looking for a way to keep up your karate training during this quarantine, then you've probably spent a lot of time working on kata like I have. Some of the best performances of kata have been likened to a form of moving meditation, where the pattern of stepping and striking, inhaling and exhaling, induces a state known as mushin, a mental state where you cease to be preoccupied with thought and analysis of your opponent, and let your mind and body flow freely, reacting or acting when an opportunity presents itself. This state of mind is considered one of the key goals of Zen practice, and was sought for by practitioners of Bushido, the warrior code of the Japanese samurai. But wait a minute. Karate is an Okinawan tradition, not a Japanese one. In fact, many styles of karate trace their techniques back to China, whether from the Shaolin temples, or from martial artists who visited Okinawa, or even from legendary fighters who washed up on shore. And Okinawa wasn't officially part of Japan until after the Meiji Restoration, which eliminated the position of samurai and reformed the government to resemble a British parliamentary system. So why do so many dojos draw on Zen and Bushido as inspirations for their teaching? Today, I want to look at why Zen Buddhism and Bushido are so important in karate, despite not being related to its origins, and what we can learn from these traditions in our modern practice. Let's get into it. The history of the term Bushido and its modern implications is a complicated and interesting one, as is the idea that Zen is connected with martial arts traditions. While the term Bushido doesn't appear until the Edo period, ideas about the way of the warrior stretch back to Confucian roots. Both Japan and the Ryukyu kingdoms, which are modern-day Okinawa, adopted caste systems that were modeled on the Confucian four occupations, which were the warrior official, peasant farmer, craftsman, and merchants, always in that order. Due to the importance of their positions, the warrior officials were expected to uphold certain standards of both competency and loyalty. And Zen itself was also prevalent in Japanese life as early as the Kamakura period, although other sects of Buddhism such as Nichiren and other religious practices such as Shinto were also fairly common. However, even though both Zen and codes of warrior ethics existed in Japan for many years, there is little evidence either that there was a standard code of the way of the warrior, or that Zen was even a part of the lives of most samurai. The patronage of Zen temples was often highly political, and as with other religious institutions, Zen temples were more involved in court life than on the battlefield. The connection between Zen and martial arts has always been tenuous, but the two most influential proponents of this connection seem to focus on the martial traditions of the Edo period, when the Tokugawa shogunate had succeeded in reunifying Japan after its Warring States period. These proponents were Suzuki Daisetsu, a lay practitioner of Zen whose works include Zen in Japanese culture, as well as a number of translations, and Eugen Herigel, famous for Zen in the Art of Archery. Suzuki's work has been some of the most influential, as well as some of the most controversial, to ever influence public opinion on Zen Buddhism in the Western world. Perhaps the most influential figure in his proposed history of Zen in martial arts is the monk Takuan Soho, who wrote about swordsmanship and Zen in the same writing. While he wasn't a fighter himself, Takuan provided advice to Yagyu Munenori, a famous fighter of the era, and used his Zen training as a lens through which to explore and understand sword fighting. However, Takuan's most famous historical image comes from his reported connections with Miyamoto Musashi, the famous ronin whose story was popularized by Yoshikawa Eiji's novel titled Miyamoto Musashi. It is unclear whether the real Musashi ever crossed paths with Takuan, and even if he did, his extant writing, The Book of Five Rings, seems to reject a connection to Zen or any other specific religious practice for that matter. Musashi was a well-traveled and likely well-educated man, so there's no doubt that Zen scholarship, along with many other philosophies and religions, crossed into his view and influenced his writings. But as it stands, this is only a single connection, and Suzuki doesn't provide more than anecdotal evidence that Zen was a factor in even a few individual warriors' lives, let alone a core component of their whole core of ethics. Herigel's connection is even more tenuous, as his book deals almost entirely with his first-hand account of learning Kyudo, the art of Japanese archery, and is interspersed with his own ruminations or assumptions about the connections to Zen. His Kyudo teacher, Awa Kenzo, denied any connection with Zen, so it's likely that these connections were Herigel's own leaps of logic and not reflective of any true connection. However, since he was among the first writers to tackle the topic for a Western audience, his interpretation became the standard from which much discourse around Zen in martial arts began. Although the term Bushido implies a code followed by the Bushi, members of the samurai class, the modern understanding of Bushido largely solidified after the samurai had been all but eliminated, in the Meiji and Taisho eras of the early 19th and 20th centuries. 
With Shinto having been officially separated from Buddhism, many Buddhist sects were struggling to maintain relevance and power in the newly modernized nation. A journalist named Ozaki Yukio was one of the first Japanese thinkers to reform the public opinion of the samurai class, which had previously been seen as a relic of the Tokugawa past, when he proposed that the way of the warrior could be promoted as a type of ethics comparable to the chivalry of English knights and gentlemen. During the 1890s and 1900s, Japan was looking to legitimate itself as a modern nation to America and Britain. Writers like Fukuzawa Yukichi were calling for westernization as a method of expanding and improving Japanese civilization, motivated in part by the bad example set by China, which had been overwhelmed by the British Empire. After the Sino-Japanese and Russo-Japanese wars, which both helped Japan to promote an image of a powerful modern nation, interest in the concept of Bushido rose, and the concept started to become inexorably enmeshed with growing feelings of Japanese nationalism. In 1895, the year of Japan's victory over China in the Sino-Japanese War, the Dai Nippon Butoku Kai was founded. This organization, dedicated to the promotion of martial virtue, began recognizing and popularizing martial arts under the spirit of Bushido, heavily emphasizing the supposed links that this philosophy had to historical Koryu martial arts. Many of the organizations and schools that joined the Butoku Kai, or who wrote and demonstrated for other organizations and political bodies at the time, claimed dubious or even fictitious connections to the Bushido history as a patriotic display. The fact that several Koryu schools had traceable lineages through to the Ashikaga shogunate, and purported lineages that went back even further, reinforced a popular narrative that Bushido was a historical ethic rather than a modern invention. At the same time, proponents of neglected Buddhist sects seized onto connections with Bushido to reaffirm their political power and legitimacy. While much of the Bushido discourse early on had been dominated by the Shinto interests of the Meiji government or by Western ideals of chivalry, Zen Buddhists specifically were able to select various writings to increase their perceived connection to Bushido and, by extension, to Japanese patriotism. Suzuki Daisetsu was key in establishing this connection, arguing heavily for the utility of Zen training in the Bushido notions of accepting death bravely and refusing surrender or capture by the enemy in war. The Zen school was one of the most successful in tying its teachings to a sense of Japanese nationalism, leading to many scholars projecting the constructed notion of Bushido back into the past and ascribing Zen as the religion of the samurai. In the early 20th century, Japanese nationalism was heavily on the rise. In an effort to become an imperial power, Japan invaded the Korean peninsula, parts of Russia, and eventually conquered and established the puppet state of Manchukuo to the north of China. Much of the narratives around Bushido heavily influenced Japanese attitudes towards war and conquest, attitudes which would rear their heads in the Second World War. Rejection of surrender and the exhortation to face death without fear were used to justify some of the greatest tragedies that took place in the Japanese army, most notably the suicide missions that needlessly killed thousands of Japanese soldiers. After the war, the nationalist fervor that it integrated into the martial arts was so pervasive that the occupying U.S. forces forbade the practice and promotion of several martial arts and completely disbanded the Dainippon Butoku Kai. However, by doing this, they inadvertently legitimized the idea that these concepts were in some way connected. But of course, all things considered, karate was a latecomer on this scene. Introduced to Japan properly in the 1920s, karate had little to no chance of connecting itself to the samurai traditions that Bushido claimed to represent. So how did the native fighting styles of Okinawa get wrapped up in Japanese nationalism? While the Ryukyu kingdoms had had their own version of a Confucian caste system, their feudal traditions were quite different than the samurai-run government of Japan's shogunal rule. Zen Buddhism did have a chance to reach the Ryukyuans, but their indigenous religious beliefs were much more analogous to Shinto. While it's likely that some practitioners of Todi or Ti may have also studied Zen, much like their samurai counterparts, the martial artists of the Ryukyu were almost certainly not involved in Buddhism to a high level. However, when Ryukyu became Okinawa, an official part of Japan, its martial arts became subject to the scrutiny of Japanese society. While several prominent Japanese martial artists, such as Judo founder Kano Jigoro, were impressed by the power and utility of the systems, many viewed the traditions as rough and brutish, mirroring their prejudice towards the island people themselves. In order to promote and preserve karate, Okinawan pioneers such as Itosu Anko, Funakoshi Gichin, and Miyagi Chojun adapted and altered karate to make it fit more with the Japanese martial culture and nationalist Bushido. This is when the gi and belt ranking systems were adopted, the kantas were simplified and taught to large classes, and the first shihan teacher grades were awarded to masters of karate. This was also when the kanji spelling was altered from Chinese hand to empty hand, 
a move which both distanced the art from one of Japan's political rivals and made it much more appealing to the Zen school of Buddhism. However, even when they adopted these Japanese cultural standards to be allowed to continue to train, that didn't mean that Karateka adopted the belief system behind those traditions. Since the Okinawan people had been victims of the discrimination born from Japanese nationalism, there was clearly some reluctance with which they embraced the nationalist elements of Bushido. However, the connection between karate and the way of the warrior would return after the war from a very unexpected source. Okinawa was occupied by the United States Civil Administration of the Ryukyu's forces from America until 1972, and much of the islands are still occupied with American military bases. In the post-war period, many American soldiers were stationed on Okinawa, and during that time a fair few of them became students of the local martial arts. After the disastrous Battle of Okinawa, there were definitely tensions between the troops and the occupants, however, most of the GIs didn't speak much Japanese or Uchinaguchi, and as such had a hard time understanding local teachers. Some senseis managed to bridge this gap by developing new techniques for teaching, such as Toguchi Sekichi sensei, who developed a series of Kihon Kata and Bunkai Kumite. However, because of this language barrier, many of the cultural nuances, such as the separation between karate and Japanese martial arts, were not as easily translated. The karate that these soldiers brought back to America was often colored by the Orientalist preconceptions that many Americans still held about the Japanese. As a result, the as-of-yet unchallenged concept of Bushido was folded into the first karate dojos that opened in America, Britain, France, and other nations. Many of these new schools folded Zen, or Zen-related practices, into their training, not knowing the full historical context of karate's integration into Japanese culture. While Zen and Bushido may not have a connection to the origins of karate, however, these concepts have become an important part of many karateka's lives and practice. Kata may have not been originally designed as moving meditations, but when you get in the zone, you can definitely experience a state similar to meditation while you're running through your kata practice. Though Miyamoto Musashi didn't practice karate, and wasn't a student of Zen, in The Book of Five Rings, he writes about the state of mind in strategy. Much of his writing was concerned not just with sword technique, but with fighting and strategy more broadly, so I think that we can learn from his writings, even as karateka. He writes, In daily life as well as in strategy, it is necessary to have an ample and broad mind and to carefully keep it very straight, not too tight and not at all loose. In order not to have your mind too much off to one side, it is necessary to place it in the center and move it calmly so that it does not cease to move even in moments of change. The wisdom of strategy is entirely distinct. Even right in the middle of battle where everything is in rapid movement, it is necessary to attain the most profound principle of strategy, which assures you have an immovable mind. These quotes portray a mental state that is very similar to what some Zen practitioners strive to achieve with Mushin. In martial arts, the benefits of such a state are to allow you to see clearly and act or react without the instant of hesitation that pondering for a moment will leave. Even if Zen isn't historically tied to karate, or any martial art for that matter, its philosophy can offer lessons that can be applied to your practice. However, the biggest thing that Zen and Bushido can teach us about karate, in my opinion, is that we should stay grounded in our own personal goals for training. It can be easy to get sucked into the Japanese feel of a dojo, with shoji screens, calligraphy, and geese. But in the end, we're all in the dojo to learn karate, for self-defense, for exercise, or even for fighting skills. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please give the video a like, and while you're down there, comment what topics in karate you'd like to see me take a deeper look into. If you're interested in learning more about the history of karate, I have a History of Goju Ryu series that covers the origin of my style and the lineages and backgrounds of the major organizations that teach Goju Ryu to this day. Also, if you'd like to see more of these videos, subscribe to this channel and hit the notification icon so you get notified when I upload new videos. I've been the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and clear your mind, Grasshopper.